called the blessed hope of the believer. But my friend, the message that God's laid upon my heart is not a happy one because it's what takes place after that glorious day, after the rapture of the church. God is going to get his family, his people, out of harm's way, and then he's going to pour out his wrath. And the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians that he hath not appointed us to wrath. And the wrath for our sin was paid for at Calvary. There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And God's going to give out uh, rewards for faithful service. And we will give an account for how we have lived. But it will be an inventory. It will be a time of, of rejoicing. It will be a time of, of embarrassment to some. Uh, we're told that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, some who have lived their life to the flesh and lived their life to their own selfish will and that kind of thing, and they see Jesus Christ up close and personal, and they realize they should have surrendered their whole life to serve him. And, but uh, nonetheless, uh, if they have been born again, blood-bought, have their name in the Lamb's book of life, they've been saved, then they enter into God's rest. But during that time in heaven, and we're told about that in, in uh, Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5, in that time of heaven, then right after that in Revelation chapter 6 begins God's warning of what's going to take place in this world. If you'll turn with me, please, to Revelation chapter 6, and if you will compare prophecy, compare Scripture with Scripture, it gives you a better picture of, of the, the whole story of what God wants us to have. Let me explain. God gave us four Gospels, and there's a theme about who Jesus Christ in each one of those Gospels. Therefore, there are some things that are emphasized in one Gospel that's not emphasized in another Gospel, and perhaps is not even included in, in another Gospel. And uh, although the, they're telling the same account, same story, there's emphasis that is given in the Gospels differently based on the, the, the reason and the theme for that Gospel. But you put the four Gospels together and you have the complete picture of what God wants us to see about Jesus Christ. Well, the same is true in, when you look at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And your Bible might say, in the, in the beginning of the book of Revelation, it might say something like Revelation of St. John the Divine or something like that. Uh, may I tell you that that was added by the publisher, okay? That was, that's not inspired. Uh, I believe the, the, the more accurate title would be the beginning of the book where it says the Revelation of Jesus Christ. And so we want him to be lifted high. And so if you, if you have your finger there in Revelation chapter 6, may we not turn a deaf ear to the words of our Savior, Jesus Christ. May we not, uh, you, we need to hear his voice more than you need to hear my voice. That's, that's an understood thing, right? And so if you want to flip back to Matthew 24, hold your finger in, Matthew, in, in Revelation 6. But if you want to flip back to Matthew 24, uh, we'll read a few verses in, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus gave speaking to Israel, speaking to Israel. Be very careful and cautious. Uh, all Scripture is written for us, but all Scripture is not written to us, okay, as a church. And all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, okay? It's all written for us, but it's not necessarily all written to us. Read your own mail, all right? And uh, uh, don't try to take something that God intended for someone else. And he's speaking to the Jews. And, and if you, if the Lord showed me something, uh, Brother Bob, the Lord showed me something that was kind of neat. Uh, I, it's just a simple thing, a little thing, and, and I just, I, um, but Matthew 24 He's talking about the tribulation period because, because right prior to that, we find that Israel rejected him as their Messiah. And so the 483 years prophesied by Daniel, it just stopped. It stopped at that point. It's as if God took the prophecy stopwatch and, and, and hit the button. And we're in a pause mode right now. And this pause mode uh, is referred to as an age 
of grace. It's referred to as the church age. And we don't know how long it will last. But it's kind of like whenever you are with family, okay, and then the family has to leave and go back to their home. And then six months later, a year later, the family comes back for Christmas or, or some, some special day, and they come back to visit, and it's like you just pick up where you left off. May I tell you today that the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to Israel, and he's telling them to be prepared because it's as if Whenever the tribulation picks up, it's like Jesus begins speaking again to them in Matthew 24, okay? So, be careful. Don't, don't try to force this into the rapture, all right? Don't, don't force this into our age, but, uh, but in where it was intended, uh, he's speaking to Israel. Verse 15 of Matthew 24, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his, out of his house. Verse 21, skip down. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, the, these days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and, and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be black and darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Verse 32, now learn a parable of the fig tree, when his branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Skip down to verse 42. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Verse 44. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. I invite you to study this whole passage I invite you to read it over and read it over slowly and thoughtfully and meditatively and ask the Lord Jesus to speak to our heart because he's giving the children of Israel, he's telling them when the, answer, the question was, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? This world is going to come to an end. It's not eternal, folks. It's winding down. And even the scientists are realizing that and, and, and all this kind of thing. You know, let me, explain, let me explain it this way to us as a church. You say, preacher, you're saying the tribulation period, the church, the Christians, the saved people, we're not going to be here. That's what the Bible teaches, yes. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we'll, we'll touch on that again tonight. We're not going to be here during that time, absolutely. Then why should we spend time on it in, in our precious redeeming the time emphasis? Why is it important for us as a church to look at what the tribulation period is going to be like? My friend, as we see things setting up in these historic times in which we live, as we see the stage being set and all the players in, into position and things, and we say, well, wait a minute, I, I know what the Lord has prophesied is going to take place in seven years, and I see things, it's not started, but I see things all getting ready. It just means to us that our redemption is drawing nearer. Have you ever seen when you go to the grocery store, have you ever seen uh, the decorations for Christmas going up. You ever seen that? And when you see the decorations of Christmas going up and, and you say, wait a minute, what, what, what? And you realize that Thanksgiving is just around the corner. They don't decorate much for Thanksgiving, but boy, they do for Christmas. Listen, please. 
there are no signs about the rapture, but there are, there are things that are going to get in place and that are already getting in place today so that the prophecy can be fulfilled to its nth degree. Now, how do, I, how do I know this is going to take place? How can we be sure? Well, let me, let me state it this way. I believe every one of us, whether someone's an atheist or whether someone's a, a Muslim or someone's a Christian, uh, someone's a Jew, I think everyone would agree that there was a historical person that walked the earth named Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, most people would, would, would certainly uh, uh, just give assent to the fact that this person, after all, you know, even our date period is, is uh, uh, B.C., before Christ, A.D., Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. I mean, every time you sign uh, 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 something and put the date beside it, you are giving testimony to the existence of our Lord Jesus Christ when he walked this earth. And if we take the next step and we find that he was born in Bethlehem, he was born of a virgin, and we start going down through the prophecies, a hundred prophecies fulfilled with pinpoint accuracy, every single one of them, about his first coming, and he didn't miss a beat on one of those prophecies. There are 300 prophecies about his second coming. And he had 100% accuracy on the first time, and he's going to have 100% accuracy on the second time. His track record is impeccable. So these historic times, 1948, May 14th, 1948, Israel became a nation again in their land, in their land. Seventy years later, on the 70th anniversary, May 14th, 2018, the world was, was brought to the, the understanding that we are recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And Jerusalem is the, is the focal point of prophecy that God is giving to us. So you see how things are, are just, just coming into place. I'll, I'll, I'll be sharing tonight, the Lord willing, as, as if the Lord continues to direct this way, I'll be sharing tonight uh, because, because this morning this is, a, this is a brief just flyover, okay? But, but tonight we'll dig in a little bit further, and uh, I'll share also uh, in the last 12 months, I know people are, are not concerned with what happened 30 years ago, 60 years ago, whatever. They want to know what's going on today. So in the last 12 months, things that have taken place that are setting up, not for the rapture, but setting up so that that seven year, and there's not, seven years is not a long time. So that all of the prophecy can be fulfilled. We're seeing some of that right now. Even though it's not started, we're seeing everything get in place. And I'll share those with you tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we look in Revelation 6. Heavenly Father, I get no joy out of preaching this message at all. It scares me to death. Lord, I, I'm like Daniel. He was dumbfounded when he saw and you revealed to him some of the things that, that you have in store. Lord, I know that we as a nation and as a world, we deserve your wrath, but Lord Jesus, thank you for taking our sin payment. Thank you for drawing us unto yourself. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your salvation. And I pray for those that may be in our midst that if the rapture took place today, that they don't know that heaven would be their home. They don't know that they would be taken. And Lord, I pray that you would open up their eyes and Lord, help them to see how much you love them and how much you want to save them. And Lord, I pray that we'll take your warning to heart. Speak to us now, every Christian, every believer. Give us a listening ear and an open heart to what your word has to share with us today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. In the book of Revelation, if you will uh, look with me in uh, chapter 6, by the way, God promises a blessing as you study the book of Revelation. Uh, God will bless you in wonderful ways. Uh, read it. Don't try to change it. Uh, read it, heed it, and uh, act on it. Um, 
Chapter 1, you see, you see Jesus revealed in all of his glory and majesty and, and pictured there. And, and John sketches down as best he can the vision he saw of, of the risen Christ. Chapters 2 and 3 is a, is a picture and message to the church, seven churches. And it's amazing how God, in his vast knowledge and omniscience and, and foreknowledge and, and, and seeing ahead, you can see the progress of the church age in these seven churches. And that's a whole other message, but it, it matches with, with the progression of, of, the, of the church and, and uh, how, how far we are sliding away from our Lord and uh, all, all these things. And chapter 4 and chapter 5 is a picture of, of uh, in, in heaven. And uh, it's just kind of an, an understanding of what the church and what the believers in Christ, those who are saved, are going to uh, be doing up in heaven. Some of those things in chapter 4 and chapter 5 during the tribulation. And because chapter 6, chapter 6, chapter 8 and 9, and chapter 16 in Revelation... If you want to uh, uh, compare Scripture with Scripture on prophecy, then I encourage you to, to take those and take Daniel 9 through 12 and, uh, and compare and study uh, the Word of God together. So there are some things, although I'm not going to spend a lot of time going to chapter 16 and chapter 8 and 9 and these kinds of things, I'm going to fill in some blanks that are not given in chapter 6 from these other texts. Suffice it to say, uh, at any point, at any time, I'm, I'm, God being my witness and my helper, I'm not making this stuff up. If it's not in chapter 6, it's in chapter 8, chapter 9, or chapter 16. I'm not making it up. I'm, I'm just sharing with you for the sake of time uh, the, the complete message that, that God gives to us in His Word. Understand that this world is on a collision course with judgment. And there's nothing that anyone can do to stop it. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1, the Bible says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. This is the first uh, of, of the seals that the, the Lamb, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, is, is breaking open. And what was held uh, and, and hidden, he now reveals. He reveals to us as the church. He reveals to the world. He reveals in advance of what's going to take place. Because there are people that are going to open the Word of God during this period of time, and they're going to preach what God has to say, and it's going to be right on the button. And uh, this, this, first, this first horse introduces the thought that some of you have, have heard of, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, don't get hung up on, on all that, uh, but, but the Bible does present this, this first man coming in riding on a white horse. Now, this is, this is a, a man that's bringing in a heroic kind of way peace to the world. The Bible says he, has a, he had a bow. Notice there are no arrows in the bow, okay? No weapons. This is not a peace that is fought for. This is a... This is a uh, uh, this is a peace that is, that is brought because of chaos. Uh, I don't know the kind of chaos that's going to take place at the rapture. I, I don't have any idea, but, but there's going to be turmoil, and there's going to be things going on in this world the, like, like we could not imagine. And there's going to be a superman show up. He is going to be, the Bible calls him, the Antichrist. Uh, two meanings of the word anti, uh, against... Christ, and it also can mean instead of Christ. And he will claim to be Christ. Uh, he will claim to be, and, and if you'll, you'll study in the other passages, chapter 8 and, and uh, chapter 16, you'll find that it refers to him as having seven heads. Wow, that's, that's crazy, you know, seven-headed monster. Um, I, I, I believe it. the Bible tells us in, in, those other, in those other passages that one of those heads will be as uh, the one who was killed and yet is alive. 
May I, may I suggest to you that the Antichrist is going to claim to be Jesus Christ and other leaders of the past, six other world leaders, religious leaders uh, of, of the past, uh, perhaps a reincarnation, perhaps an embodiment. He will claim all of these things. And Jesus said, said, don't be deceived, because he, here in this first seal, if you're jotting down something, I'm going to ask you to jot down these words. It'll begin with the letter D, deception. Deception. He will deceive the world and he'll present peace. He'll present peace. The Bible says he went forth conquering and to conquer, but he did not conquer with armies at this point. He's conquering, promising peace. During this time, uh, Israel will sign a peace treaty that he will, uh, he, he will make happen. The Antichrist will... will uh, vector this, this signing of the peace tree between Israel and the world. Could you imagine this? Israel and Islam saying, we will be friends. Could you imagine that? I mean, all of the terrorist attacks and all these kinds of things and all this, this mean uh, uh, verbiage going, going on back and forth between, between Israel and Islam and all that kind of thing. The world would say, if you can make peace between them and if you can allow them to build that temple and all that kind of thing right there on the Temple Mount and make everybody happy, you're the answer man. Not only that, but this Antichrist will have great power, lying wonders. He will have the power of Satan in him. Now, let me, let me remind you of something. You remember in Matthew? Remember in Matthew chapter 4? Remember after Jesus was baptized, he went into the wilderness and he fasted 40 days and he was tempted of the devil? Do you remember when he made a, an offer? Satan, Lucifer, made an offer to the Son of God. And he said, all the kingdoms of the world will I give thee if you bow down and worship me. The, the Antichrist will be a taker on that deal. And Satan will give him all the kingdoms of the world. That was, not a, 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 that was not a fake offer. The world lieth in the lap of the wicked one, the Bible says. And he is able to bring the, the leaders and the people. And here's this man on this white horse coming in as a hero, as a superman, you might say. And with this bow, with this bow of peace, deception. And yes, they will build the, the, the temple. One of these things I will share tonight uh, will be how that nine months ago, you may not have seen this in the news, but nine months ago, Israel dedicated a portable altar of sacrifice. It was in the news. They, they, uh, a, a portable altar of sacrifice. The reason being was whenever, and they're looking forward to this, they're looking forward to the temple being built, that whenever they get permission to do it, that they can immediately bring that altar, this portable altar, to the, to the place even without the temple in place. And they can begin offering sacrifice. All the elements are there. All the, the priests are there. By the way, for the, for the uh, dedication in December of last year, nine months ago, for that dedication, they had the priests there and they, they offered a lamb and the whole nine yards. They went through all the things. You may not have seen that in the news, but it happened. Things are ready. Deception. Deception. Uh, in this, in this uh, leadership of deception, you find the Antichrist. You'll find in, in Scripture, we're not going to deal with it this morning, but the image of the, of, the, of the Antichrist referred to as the beast and the false prophet. Uh, again, I'm not going to spend much time at, at all on this, but uh, uh, the Muslim world is looking forward to their 12th imam. And the 12th imam is, is, the, is the one who will be the messianic imam. And they teach, in the Hadith, they teach that the, the 12th Imam, the Mahdi, they call him, will link up with Jesus. They call him Isa. They call him Isa uh, in their book. And they will link up with, and, and they will fight together and bring the world together. Uh, folks, everybody is poised and ready for this leader who will claim to be Jesus Christ the Antichrist, the white horse, global deception, 
Look, please, with me at verse number 3. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Global deception was in the first seal. Global domination is the second seal. Global domination. Now, you, you hear a lot of things today that, that people, I mean, it just came out of nowhere as far as I was concerned. I, I didn't really see this coming. But all of a sudden, uh, the, the, the term of being a nationalist, you know, was being replaced with being a globalist. And if you were a nationalist, if you were patriotic, folks, I'm a patriotic American, okay? And I think if someone's from Spain, they ought to be patriotic about Spain. And if someone's uh, from Sweden, they ought to be patriotic about Sweden. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it, it, it's fine, and, and, uh, and we'll try to help and try to be a blessing. But, but folks, this is, this is my homeland. And, uh, uh, but, but you see, our world and our, 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 our nation is moving now to a global approach to life. A global thing and they're using the, the, the global warming and these kinds of things to as, as a weapon and um, uh, but folks this will be a time everything that, that that I'm sharing with you here is God's response to the world in a global fashion he's gonna deal with the world in a global way global domination there will be World War three in the first part of the tribulation period the Bible calls it the Battle of Gog don't confuse that with the Battle of Gog and Magog that takes place at, at the end of the, at the kingdom. We'll deal with that another time. But uh, there, there will be uh, kingdoms rise up against the Antichrist, and, and uh, we don't have time to get into all that. But, but that'll be war going on. Uh, in, this, in this time, there's going to be two witnesses, and we find that in Revelation chapter 11, and two witnesses, two prophets, that God is going to bring on the scene some people think it could be Moses and Elijah. Some people think it could be others. I, that's, not, that's not the point of who, of who it is. Um, but, uh, but these two prophets of God, for the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, they're going to be God's witness, God's voice during this time. And boy, they're going to be preaching the truth. And they're going to be, the Bible says that, that if anyone tries to stop them, anyone tries to kill them, that they have power from God and fire will come out of their mouth and consume them. They could, they could pray and stop the, the, the rain from falling on, on the earth. They will have great power upon them. They have to because the Antichrist will have the power of, of Satan himself, second greatest power in all the universe on the Antichrist. So these men will have the power of God upon them. For three and a half years, they'll preach. In, at, the, at the close of this three and a half years, the Bible says that, that the Antichrist will war with and fight with the two witnesses, and they will be complete in their... I, I love that part. I love that part in Scripture. It says when, when, when they have completed, when they have done what God told them to do, that they will be killed. Let me tell you something today. Let me remind you, because what I'm, what I'm about to share with you is much, much worse than I've said so far. A Christian walking in the will of God is invincible until God is done with you. Until God is done with you. Look at uh, the three Hebrew young men in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 3 and how that God uh, protected them even in the fiery furnace. But you see, when, when God was done with the apostle Paul, he laid down his life, and they took his head. But he was done. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. So the Bible says that he, the Antichrist, will fight with these two false, uh, excuse me, these, these two witnesses for, for, for the Lord, and, and their dead bodies will lay there in Jerusalem for three and a half days. At the end of three and a half days, the Bible says that in front of their enemies, God will raise up those two witnesses, give them life, and, you know, they'll be scared to death. And God says that he will ascend them up to heaven. Right after that, we find the abomination of desolation of where 
the Antichrist will reveal his true colors, and the Bible says that the blinders from Israel will be removed. And they will see and realize that he is the false one, that he is the lying one, and that Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that he is, he was, and always will be the Holy Son of God, their Messiah. The Bible says in Zechariah chapter 12 that they will look upon him whom they have pierced. And as it were, Israel in one day will come back to the Lord Jesus. And there will be a, a, a 12,000 from, and you'll read about that in, in Revelation chapter 14, 12,000 from each tribe of Israel, 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Think about it. 144,000 Apostle Pauls run through the earth. And the Bible says that the, 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 the gospel will be preached to every corner of the world. Domination. That's just a second seal. The third seal, we see desolation. Deception, global deception, global domination, and global desolation. Verse 5, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Desolation. We find that in, in this second seal that there was war. And by the way, Famine follows war like night follows day. The terrible, uh, the Bible says that a person will have to work all day long to get one meal for one person. Don't let that, that, that word penny throw you. That's denarius. Uh, that was a, a day's wage. And this, this thought of uh, uh, the, the measure of barley has an idea of a, of a quart. And so you, you take that and you, and you make one, one loaf of bread, one small loaf of bread, just enough to sustain life, work all day long, because famine has hit the, hit the land. And during the time, although it's not mentioned in chapter 6, it's, it's, it's taught very clearly in, in as, as Matthew. Revelation 6 is taught very clearly in Revelation 13 and included there about the mark of the beast. We'll spend some time on that tonight, about the mark of the beast. And basically uh, what that is, that the Bible says that there will be no buying or no selling without the mark of the beast. Now, today, there are thousands of people over in Europe that have already received uh, some implant of a chip, and they're doing this as a convenience kind of thing. Uh, others, you'll, you'll see tonight about uh, 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 an electronic tattoo that they're experimenting with and things, uh, that they can tattoo on, 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 on the hand or, or on the forehead and, and electronically uh, do that. You'll see that tonight. But um, it's more than just a convenience. You see, the Antichrist, after the war and after the, the two witnesses and after the 144,000, all that kind of thing, uh, this is going to be much more than just, hey, uh, let's just, our Apple phone, I don't want to carry around a little, little uh, uh, iPad and things. I just want to have all the community. No, it's going to be this. It's going to be, are you on my side or are you on their side? All this stuff that's going on, it's their fault. It's the, it's the, it's, it's the Christian's fault. Because you see those guys, remember those two witnesses? Could you imagine if all those, all those people had, had this power upon them and, and all this destruction? It's all their fault. Let's wipe them out. So here's what we'll do. We'll make sure that we don't harm you. If you're following me, the Antichrist, if you're following me, then you get the mark. You worship me. You get on my side. And if not, then we're going to starve you out. And if we can't starve you out, we'll kill you. That's what's going to take place. I'm not making this up. And that's why the Bible says during the tribulation period, and people use this uh, 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 incorrectly and dishonestly, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Jesus said that. Because I'm telling you, folks, if someone takes the mark of the beast, it's not simply just to get indoors. It's not s simply to buy your groceries. It's saying, I'm on his side. I've made my decision. I am following the Antichrist. I'm following Satan. I'm, follow I'm not following God. I'm not following Jesus. I've turned my back. And when someone receives the mark of the beast, they have doomed their destiny by their own choice. Desolation. Global, global desolation. 
Look at verse number 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Global destruction. Global destruction. I'm just going to give you the high points here. The Bible says the sun will scorch men. The Bible says that uh, uh, a third of the sea life will be killed, a third of the ships will be destroyed, a third of the oceans will be poisoned, and that will be by an asteroid, by some burning mountain. Uh, the, the Bible says in uh, John, the, John the Revelator, uh, what he saw was a burning mountain falling from the sky and, and landing in the ocean. And a third of all the fish and all the sea life and a third of all the ships in there, could you imagine the tidal wave? People have written books and made movies about this kind of stuff. And the destruction that, that would take place. Say, well, that, that, that doesn't happen. Do you realize that they just don't tell you about asteroids that are out there? They just don't even tell you. Because there's not a thing they can do about it. And so one scientist said this, the best thing to do about them is just to not think about it. I'll tell you about one and I'll give you more, more details. Uh, in 2004, there was an asteroid that came, came by and they found it. They spotted it. Even though they're watching asteroids, NASA and all, all those other uh, folks, they're watching the, the skies with everything that they possibly can. They're tracking over 20,000 NEO, near-Earth objects. They're, they're, they're tracking them, tracking their, their orbit and all that kind of thing. They want to know where they're going to be, you know, so that whenever they put up a, a space shuttle or whatever, they want to make sure they're not in the path and these kinds of things. So they're tracking them. Well, this one that came by in 2004, it was the size of the Empire State Building that came by. And they did not see it until after it passed us by. They didn't spot it. Came by at 500,000 miles from Earth. You say, oh, whew, boy, that's good. They're saying that is extremely close. And because of that, they decided to go ahead and give it a name. They gave it a name. And they put a track, you know, a track on its course and things. And they have said that on April the 13th, Friday, it's interesting, Friday the 13th. On, on April the 13th, 2029, that it's supposed to come very close to the earth again. On its next return, it's coming that, that day, they're saying, and it's coming within 15,000 miles. That is the same distance as some of our satellites that we have up around the world. And the scientists are excited about it because they're saying never in recorded history have we ever had an asteroid of that size ever come that close to us. We're going to learn some wonderful things. You can look it up. Check me out. I'm not making it up. Apophis, they've called it. God of chaos is what it means. I'm not saying at all. I'm not setting a date. I'm not, uh, not, nothing like that, okay? Because I don't believe that just like, just like that when they didn't even see it coming in 2004 until it could have already hit us. So although they're bragging, that's not the only one that they've missed. I did some research on this, and boy, I tell you, they, got, they say that there's so many objects flying around out there, there's no way they can be ready and see all of them. They just can't. They're sending up, getting ready to send up some kind of a, a satellite that, that, that will do just that, to, to watch these kinds of things. Destruction, destruction, people dying, billions of people will die. Plagues. The Bible says in verse number 8, we just read, with sword, with hunger, and with death. Death will use death. Isn't that a little redundant to say that? May I remind you of, of things that we have today that bring death? Ebola. All kinds of viruses and biological warfare and all these kinds of things that, that uh, uh, are mass destruction. If you have these things, let me give them to you again quickly. Global deception, global domination, global desolation, global destruction. Look, please, with me at verse 9. 
And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. For the sake of time, let me just tell you this, this one, global depravity. Believers will be killed, and they'll be killed by being beheaded. Believers are being beheaded today. That's no shock. You're aware of that. They're being beheaded today. And I believe that there's probably a couple of reasons uh, because they want to be sure that, that they don't come back to life like those two witnesses did. So they want to be sure they, that, they, that they do it and it's finished. Uh, it's possible with all the suffering that's going on. Do you realize that if, if someone is, is, is uh, capital punishment is killed with, with a gun, then certain organs of the body can't be used. Do you realize that, that organs are, are, in, are in great demand? You know? If someone dies by lethal injection, that has corrupted throughout the body and this poison throughout the body. But if someone is beheaded, then you see the eyeballs can be used, and the lungs can be used, and the heart can be used, and all these kinds of things can be used. And see, we're, we're doing a good thing. We're getting these people out of the way that are, that are harming us, and we're going to help those that are in need. Now, I don't know if that's the mantra or not, but the Bible does say they'll be beheaded. Revelation, Revelation chapter 20 tells us that. Believers will be beheaded, but in this time of depravity, demons will be released from the bottomless pit. The Bible says that, that there will be a star that will come from heaven, fall from heaven with a key to the bottomless pit, and refers to this, this star as a him, not as an it. It's not a physical thing. It's not a meteor. Not a, it, it's a person, and he has the key to the bottomless pit. May I tell you today, where'd that key come from? Revelation chapter 1, Jesus said, I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of hell. He had to be given the key to the bottomless pit. And the Bible says that these, these wicked, uh, demon, demonic spirits will come as locusts. They say that over there in the Middle East, as, as locusts will, would attack, that the sun will be darkened because of the, the, the many locusts. We'll, we'll deal with this tonight, and we'll touch on this, this more because it is a very shocking, and, and, uh, and frankly, I'm glad I won't be here. The last one. Look at verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell on the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heavens departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and their chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every freeman hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us! And hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? The Bible tells us a third of the population will be slain. Billions of people dying. The Bible tells us a third of the daylight will be darkened. Meteor shower, it seems, the, the picture that's given to us here, that there'll be some kind of thing falling from heaven, uh, as, as uh, uh, just, just falling everywhere, uh, and will cause a third of the trees to be burned up and all grass to be burned up, and a global earthquake. The Bible tells us in chapter 16 of Revelation that every island will be submerged and every mountain will be leveled. A global earthquake. And just like that phone, <laughs> the Lord will come. You see, all the nations will be gathered together against Israel to try to put a stop to all this, thinking that Israel is the cause. And before that they can destroy Israel, Jesus shows up and says, that's my people. And it's not just because of the nation of Israel, but because they have surrendered their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they've been saved just like you and me, by God's grace. Now, folks, I said a lot in this period of time. And I know that, that many people are thinking, that's just 
unbelievable. If it weren't in the Bible, I wouldn't believe it either. But it's in God's Word. It's going to take place. Are you saved? If the trumpet were to blow and the voice of the archangel and Jesus Christ says, come up hither, as it says in Revelation 4 and verse 1, and the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 that it will happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. It won't be something. I mean, the dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught together with them in the clouds. I mean, in all of that in the... It's gone. That fast. Faster, probably. And in churches, if it happens on a Sunday morning, in churches, the most tragic thought I could think of would be that someone would be sitting there and looking around and they're wondering where everyone else went. Oh, preacher, <laughs> I'm glad you told me. I am so thankful that you told me about this because, you know, I heard that people will be saved during the tribulation period. Okay, I'll be first. I'll be one of the first ones. I, man, I'll hit my knees immediately and I'll get saved. No, you won't. Oh, what are you, what are you telling me? The Bible says that you won't. No man cometh unto the Father, excuse me, cometh unto the Son, except the Father draw him. And the Holy Spirit will be taken out of this world. And furthermore, I'm sorry to tell you that because I've told you the gospel of Jesus Christ, and if you have rejected it of your own free will, that God will seal your decision. He will help you stick to your decision, and you'll believe the lie that will be told. So, folks, say, what, what, do, I, what do I do about it? Dr. R.G. Lee, one of the great preachers of the past, he's with the Lord now. He tells this story. In one of his messages, he told about how that uh, a school an elementary school in North Carolina caught fire. And there was a part of the school where, where some of the children got trapped. This was years ago. The, the alarm sounded and all that kind of thing that they had even back then, but, but, but these children got, got trapped in, in one part of the school. The strong men got there. They got there quickly as, as fast as they could, and they, they tried every which way, but because of the possibly things that were in that, in that area of the school, it just turned into an inferno. Flesh and blood could not get to them. They didn't have the, the, the fire and all that, the, the equipment and the, and the trucks there, and it all happened so quickly. And they were trying to find some way to get at these children. They heard them. One man, he looked, and he could see through the flames. He saw the, the flames lighting up the face of his son. He saw his son. His son saw him. He said, Daddy, can you save me? They had to hold that man back. It would have been sheer suicide. There was no way in. He stood there. And he watched his son wilt right before his very eyes. Like a, a flower would wilt with a settling torch on it. He stood there and witnessed his own son burning to death. R.G. Lee said that that man, his hair immediately in the next few days turned white. He sorrowed. And sorrowed. The only thing he could, he could picture in his mind for days and weeks and months on end was the face of his son and his voice saying, Daddy, Daddy, can you save me? That man only lived two years. Young man, young father, and he died. Probably of a broken heart. The Bible says that at the end of this time, that men will be crying out to the rocks, save me, hide me from the Lamb. They would cry out to science, science, can you save me? Science says, I can't save you. Education, can you 
save me? I can teach you how to work a computer. I can, I can tell you about the history of the world, but I, I can't save you. Government, government, can you save me? Listen, please. Washington, D.C. can't save us. What can save me? The rock of ages, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is ready, he is willing, and he is able to save you. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And he's available today. Tomorrow, I cannot promise it. Tonight, I cannot promise it. But I can, at this moment, tell you that today is the day of salvation, that now is the accepted time. Will you receive him today? Oh, preacher, if I get saved, people are going to talk. If I get saved, if I, if I trust Christ and God's dealing with my heart and I don't want to go through tribulation, and I certainly don't want to go to the lake of fire, but everybody thinks I'm a Christian. I'm up in years. Folks, eternity is forever. Why not just say, Lord Jesus, I don't know what's going on in my heart right now, but you are dealing with me. I will receive you. I want to settle this once and for all, for all of eternity, to know that heaven's my home. Jesus is my Savior. He's my Lord. If you'll do that today, God has promised to save you today. He'll pen your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's your choice. Either choose him, or one day you'll choose your own doom and destiny. And you'll do that of your own choice too. Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts now, I pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would draw souls to your Son, the Lord Jesus. I'm brokenhearted. I'm asking you to receive the gift of God's salvation right now while there's time. God loves you and his arms are open. Say, so, well, preacher, what do I do? Would you come to him in prayer? He's ready to hear you. He's ready to answer your prayer. He's ready to save you today. Would you pray something like this but mean it from your heart? Would you do it? Would you do it? Pray this, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose again like the Bible says. I ask you to come into my heart and my life. Save my sinful soul. I'm trusting you, Lord Jesus, to take me to heaven when I die. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for coming for me one day. Help me to live for you till I see you. I'll close the prayer in just a moment. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Would you do what a Bible, the Bible says would be the right thing to do? Would you give praise unto the name of your Savior who just saved you? If he did that, if you asked him to save you, would you give praise to his name right now? We're not going to embarrass you, but give you an opportunity to thank him for the salvation that's come into your heart and life. You say, preacher, I prayed that and I meant it. I'm going to look right now. No one else is looking. If you say, preacher, I did that just then, slip your hand up just so I can see it and rejoice with you. Would you do that today? Just slip it up and hold it just for a minute. God bless you, sir. Yes. Yes, God bless you, ma'am. Yes. How about you, sir? Young man, young lady? Mom? Yes, ma'am. God bless your heart. Amen. God heard your prayer. Yes, sir. God bless you back there. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. Amen. Who else? Say, preacher, I meant that. I, I, I came before the, the Holy Son of God and asked for his salvation. Say, preacher, I meant it and asked Jesus to save me. Who else? Anyone else? Let me rejoice with you. This is wonderful. I rejoice with you. We're not going to experience this that we just preached on, but others will. So we must go and give the good news. Heavenly Father, the good news of the gospel is that you love sinners and you died on the cross for us. I thank you for these dear folks that said yes to you today. And I pray and ask you, Lord, that you would help us as Christians, as believers in Christ, to not just tuck this away, 
but Lord, to realize and to envision our friends and our loved ones that enter this tribulation period without any hope. It could start up any day. 